Uh, what is happening at your house? Are you being arrested? I'm being arrested. I'm just going out now with the police. <laughs> Why are they arresting you? They are arresting me uh, on an allegation of felony, namely treason or something like that. They are not doing anything, they are just taking me away. Please let me go. You know, I'm delaying them. And so where are you now? Are you in your car? I'm in my car now. Is it police who are with you in your car or are they escorted? Are they yes, the, the commissioner of police is in the car with me. And my senior wife is in the car with me. Why are they letting you talk on the phone to the BBC while they're in the middle of arresting you? <laughs> they have come to arrest me, not to arrest my mouth. You sound very cheerful about it, Chief Abiola. Of course. You know... <laughs> Nineteen ninety three was a year of farce, even by Nigerian standards. It featured a presidential election that cost fifteen percent of GDP only to be retroactively declared void, the military displacement of a civilian government and three different governments in three months. Now the military had another chance to end the chaos. After shunting Shonekon aside, the military's attention turned to determining his successor without amplifying the crisis or provoking a backlash from the civilian populace or aggressive elements in the military. After Shonekon's resignation, Abacha, Dia and other senior officers flew down from Abuja to Lagos. Dia held a midnight press briefing at the Air Force Mess on Kufa Bayomi Road in Victoria Island, Lagos. The following day, Abacha summoned all military officers with the rank of Brigadier General upwards and police officers with the rank of Assistant Inspector General of Police upwards for a briefing at the Defence Headquarters in Dodan Barracks. After two and a half hours, Abacha departed without fielding questions from reporters and headed for his official home at Flagstaff House on First Avenue in Ikoei, Lagos, where he continued consultations with senior military officers and the Inspector General of Police, Ibrahim Kumasi. Senior officers later held another meeting at the Lagos Guest House of Brigadier General Bashir Magashi for the customary hard bargaining that follows military takeovers. The following officers attended the meeting. Abacha, Dia, Brigadier General Chris Ali, Lieutenant Colonel Sambu Dasuki, Brigadier Generals Ishaya Bamei and Patrick Aziza, Major General Tajuddin Olarenwaju, Air Commodore Magnus Johnson, Brigadier General Ahmed Abuki Abdullahi, and Colonel Lawan Gwadabi. At the meeting, they agreed to appoint Abacha as the new head of state and Dia as Abacha's deputy and chief of general staff. Major General Abdul Salam Abubakar as chief of defense staff and Rear Admiral Alison Madekwe as chief of naval staff to succeed Rear Admiral Seidu. Air Vice Marshal Femi John Femi retained his position as Chief of Air Staff. However, cracks in the facade of military unity appeared when Lieutenant General Gusau suddenly resigned from his position as Chief of Army Staff and retired without giving any public explanation. The GOC of One Mechanized Infantry Division, Brigadier General Chris Ali, succeeded Gusau. However, Gusau made an ominous prediction about Dia. The two had been contemporaries at the Nigerian Defense Academy NDA and graduated together as cadets from the NDA's first regular combatant course in 1967. Gusau later told a mutual friend to tell your brother Dia that he will leave the army in disgrace. The Chief of Army Training Operations and Planning at Defense Headquarters, Major General Ishola Williams, another NDA classmate of Dia, was also unhappy. Williams was not a conformist in appearance or disposition. He usually sported a beard and despite serving in the military, 
During 23 years of military rule, he had refused appointment to political posts. He told me that he refused to attend political meeting of the senior military leadership even when summoned to do so. Williams abruptly resigned and refused to be involved with the new military takeover. He also enigmatically warned Dia that he wasn't going to last long. The fact that military rule was causing officers of the caliber of Gosau and Williams to resign prematurely out of frustration was the portent of what politics was doing to the military. Apart from the military appointments, the meeting decided that the new provisional government should have a near complete civilian profile and that the states would be governed by new civilian administrators rather than military officers. At 10.30 p.m. on November 18th, Abacha made a nationwide broadcast. After confirming that he had succeeded Shonekon as head of state, he banned all political parties, proclaimed the immediate dissolution of the ING, the National Assembly, National Electoral Commission, and State Houses of Assembly in all 30 states of the country, and fired all 30 elected state governors. In their place, Abacha announced the establishment of a new provisional ruling council led by him. Instead of appointing civilian state administrators as he initially promised, Abacha chose military administrators to govern the states. The soldiers were once again in control. There were three strange features about the manner in which Abacha took over from Shonekon. Firstly, Abacha claimed to have succeeded Shonekon as the most senior minister in accordance with Decree 61. However, that could not be so as the court had already invalidated Decree 61. Secondly, even if Decree 61 was still valid, the appropriate cause was for Abacha to replace Shonekon as INJ leader for the INJ to continue and supervise new elections as originally planned. Abacha's dissolution of the ING and of democratic structures made his assumption of power look like a coup. Thirdly, Abiola and his supporters did not object to Abacha's assumption of power. Abiola visited Abacha shortly after the latter took power. Surprisingly, many Abiola supporters were jubilant about the military's return. Some of them were heard triumphantly chanting MKO, MKO, Presido, Presido at the luxury Nikon Noga Hotel in Abuja. The day after Shonikon resigned, thousands of people in Ota, in Abiola's home state of Ogun, trooped out to celebrate the news of the ING's fall and sang solidarity songs. They staged a sit-down protest on the road at Idiroko Junction to prevent politicians from fleeing to neighboring Benin as they had done when the military overthrew the previous civilian government in 1983. However, not everyone was enthusiastic about the return to military rule. Ghani Faimi described Abacha's replacement of Shonikon as an organized change of government and added, the change of government, the present position of Abacha, had long been organized by Babangida through Decree 61 of 1993, Section 4. Shonikon was only picked up as a political courier to give a breathing space so that Abacha would come in to give effect to Section 4. Others such as the former Director General of the Center for Democratic Studies, Professor Omo Omorui, also alleged that there was a secret pact between Babangida and Abacha to rule Nigeria in succession to each other. Although Babangida denied the existence of such a pact, he admitted that Major General Garba Duba a very close friend of his once warned me that I should never allow Abacha to have the opportunity of being head of state. Although this is a historic account of a decade in the life of the nation, it would not be complete without an examination of the individuals who shaped the contours of that decade. In Nigeria's cutthroat game of throne style politics, one man stands out at the most intriguing. Abacha did not possess Balewa's eloquence, Azikwe's charms, Gowan's charm, or Babangida's breathtaking wizardry in selling the past. Yet he was probably the most mesmerizing protagonist of them all. Abacha had Pinochet's ruthlessness, Mobutu's kleptocratic streak, and the mystique of Putin. Abacha and his family were and remain intensely private. 
Even though he had spent a decade in the uppermost echelons of the government, he managed to maintain a veil of secrecy around him by the time he became head of state in 1993. Nothing was known about the quiet, diminutive man who stared out without expression from behind his dark sunglasses. That he wore strong dark glasses indoors and outdoors, day and night, added to his mystique and intimidating aura. Babangida described Abacha as a man of limited words. He doesn't talk a lot. You can't predict him. The media knew next to nothing about a man who had been de facto the second most powerful person in Nigeria for eight consecutive years. No one knew his hobbies, his favorite food or color, who his friends were or his temperament. So little was known about him that when he became head of state, media outlets could find nothing to publish other than a bland and mechanical one-paragraph recitation of the military command posts he had held during his army career. Abacha did not grant interviews, allowed no leaks to the press, and limited his public statements to test broadcasts during national near-death experiences like coups. Although Abacha's public pronouncements were rare, they always had great impact. His inaugural broadcast to the nation and set of states was his fourth pivotal public speech in a decade. His first was on December 31, 1983, when he announced the military takeover of President Shagari and Shagari's replacement by Major General Buhari. Twenty months later, Abacha announced on August 27, 1985, that Babangida had overthrown and replaced Buhari. On April 22, 1990, Abacha rallied troops in Lagos to suppress a coup against his friend Babangida, then announced the coup's failure on national broadcasts. Abacha was Nigeria's second head of state from the ancient northern city of Kanu, the first being General Mutala Mohammed. He was born in Kanu on September 20, 1943. Although Kanu is traditionally a Hausa city, Abacha's father was a Kanuri. He attended the Gida Makama Primary School and began his military training at the Nigerian Military Training College NMTC in Kaduna in 1962 along with Ibrahim Babangida, Maman Vata, Sani Sami, Sani Bello, Garba Duba, Gado Nasko, and Mohamed Mogoro. Thereafter, he proceeded to the Mons of Cadet School at Aldershot in the UK and he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1964. In the early 1960s, he met a young woman named Miriam Jida when he was a student at the Provincial Secondary School in Kano. At the time, Miriam was a student at the Dalla Girls Secondary School, also in Kano. They married in December 1965 and subsequently had 10 children, 7 sons and 3 daughters. After Nigeria's first military coup in 1966, during which Ibo officers killed several northern military and political leaders, Abacha became, according to one of his Ibo colleagues, very unfriendly and would barely exchange greetings with Ibo officers. This colleague informed me that Abacha took the coup badly. Unsurprisingly, six months later in July 1966, Abacha was among the northern officers who staged a revenge coup against Igbo officers. Abacha fought for the Federal Army during the Civil War between 1967 and 1970 as a member of the Army's 2nd Division. He remained out of the public limelight until December 31, 1983 at which time he was the commander of the Strategic 9th Mechanized Brigade in Ikeja, Lagos State. On that day, he teamed up with several of his decade-long military colleagues and friends such as Babangida, Buhari, Brigadier Generals Ibrahim Baku and Jerry Husseini and Colonel Joshua Dogoyaru to overthrow President Shagari in a military coup. After the coup, Abacha was appointed GOC of two mechanized divisions in Ibadan and a member of the Supreme Military Council, which replaced Shagari's government. Just over a year and a half later, the military leadership split and officers loyal to Babangida decided to overthrow Buhari. However, there was a sticking point. Abacha was loyal to Buhari. If Babangida could not obtain Abacha's support for the coup, it would fail and Babangida and other officers in the plot would be executed. Babangida met Abacha to personally plead for his support in deposing Buhari. According to Babangida, 
Nobody could get him to be involved except me because of our relationship. If it were any other person, he would have gone to the side of Buhari. But when I sat him down, he said, You are my chief. Anything you want, I will do. So the personal relationship also helped me in trying to recruit people into this unholy alliance. Abacha helped Babangeda to overthrow Buhari on August 27, 1985. Babangeda rewarded Abacha for his role in the coup by appointing him chief of army staff in his place when he became the new head of state. Although Babangeda continually purged the army and retired his military chiefs throughout his eight years in power, Abacha always survived such purges. Babangida dissolved the entire Armed Forces Ruling Council on February 2, 1989 and reduced its reconstituted membership from 28 to 19. Yet, Abacha remained an ARFC member. On December 29, 1989, Babangida retired all of the military service chiefs except, of course, Abacha. Not only did Abacha retain his post as Chief of Army Staff, but he gained a new portfolio as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Abacha survived Babangida's numerous purges because of his loyalty to him. Around 2 a.m. on April 22, 1990, officers from the oil producing areas of the South launched a violent coup attempt to depose Babangida. The plotters shelled Babangida's residence at Dodan Barracks in Lagos. The officer who led the assault was told to put his turret down and blow the place apart, and he undertook his mission as instructed. He blew the roof of Babangida's residence. The plotters searched for Abacha at his house but could not find him as he was visiting the friend at a nearby guest house. The mutineers then proceeded to shoot up the guest house in their search for him but could not find him as he was hiding in a bedroom concealed behind a paneled wall. The shooting alerted his driver who attempted to drive away but he was shot and wounded by the mutineers. After the mutineers departed, Abacha sent for an armored vehicle and troops to provide reinforcing guards at the guest house. He then called his son Ibrahim who picked him up in the civilian car and drove him to Flagstaff House where he rendezvoused with Bangida and other key officers. Abacha phoned key infantry, signals and military police installations and urged their commanders including Colonels Raji Razaki and Ishai Abami to counter-attack. The army's realization that Abacha was still alive dramatically changed the vacillating soldiers' reaction to the coup. One soldier informed me that many soldiers immediately swung behind Abacha after concluding that hesitation in obeying Abacha's orders was not worth the risk. The mutineers surrender after running out of ammunition following nearly 12 hours of fighting. Abacha announced the coup's failure in a characteristically terse nationwide broadcast in which he casually referred to the mutineers as national security nuisance. Later that day, Babangida addressed the nation to confirm his survival. He was especially grateful to Abacha, whom he referred to and praised by name. Abacha emerged from the April 1990 coup with his already formidable reputation greatly enhanced. Babangida promoted Abacha to a four-star general, thus making Abacha the first non-head of state ever to become a serving four-star general in Nigeria's history. Babangida also relinquished his position as Minister of Defense to Abacha, who thus simultaneously served as Minister of Defense and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The press dubbed him the Khalifa king in waiting. After that April 1990 coup, Abacha behaved like a man aware that he was untouchable. When Lieutenant General Salihu Ibrahim succeeded Abacha as Chief of Army Staff, Abacha refused to vacate Flagstaff House even though it was meant to serve as the official residence of the incumbent Chief of Army Staff. When Mubangeda moved to Nigeria's capital from Lagos to Abuja in 1991, Abacha stayed behind in Lagos and did not move to Lagos to join Babangida. The Ministry of Defense remained over 500 kilometers away from the new capital and the seat of government. This led to the creation of two rival centers of military power in Lagos and Abuja, led by Abacha and Babangida respectively. This was the beginning of Abacha's construction of his own political empire. He was bold enough to interfere with an attempt to exercise operational control 
of Obangida's personal security unit, the elite brigade of guards. He did so even though the brigade had its own commander who was not under Abacha's operational command and who reported directly to Bobangida. Even the all-powerful Bobangida treated Abacha with kid gloves and never called him to order. Bobangida tolerated Abacha's excesses because he may not be bright upstairs but he knows how to overthrow governments and overpower coup plotters. He saw to my coming in office in 1985 and to my protection in the many coups I faced. Yet the Nigerian public were largely unaware of Abacha's antecedents. Two sentences from his inaugural speech stood out. He vowed, we will not settle anybody. The fact that the head of state used a colloquial phrase such as settle, which in Nigerian parlance means to bribe someone, demonstrated the extent to which settlement culture had seeped into Nigerian society. More ominously, Abacha warned that any attempt to test our will shall be decisively dealt with. He kept his word. The interim national government is hereby dissolved. The national and state assemblies are also dissolved. The state executive councils are dissolved. The brigade commanders are to take over from the governors in their states until administrators are appointed. Where there are no brigade commanders, the commissioners of police in the states are to take over. All local governments turn dissolved. The directors of personnel are to take over the administration of the local governments until administrators are appointed. The National Electoral Commission is hereby dissolved. All former secretaries to federal ministries are to hand over to their director generals until ministers are appointed. The two political parties are hereby dissolved. All processions, political meetings, and associations of any type in any part of the country are hereby banned. Any consultative committee, by whatever name called, is hereby banned.